everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Alumni Career Pathway Series. I'm really excited to announce our panelists this evening. So <laughs> um, first I'd like to just acknowledge that we're doing this panel on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I am very honored to be able to present this in the school. So on our far left, some of you may recognize we have Annie Briard. Annie is a Canadian artist known for her practice in expanded photography and digital media. Her work challenges how we make sense of the world through visual perception. Creating lens-based and light-focused work, she explores the intersections between perception, paradigms in psychology, neuroscience, and existentialism. Her moving images, media installations, expanded and print photography have been presented in numerous solo exhibitions, recently including Staring at the Sun at La Band Video for the Quebec Biennale and Within the Eclipse at the Barard Arts Foundation as well as group shows, festivals, and fairs internationally. Recently, she presented monumental scale photographic and moving image public art projects for a number of commissions in Canada. She has been artist in residence at the Banff Center for Arts, Eastside Los Angeles, and others. Annie's work has received support from Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, and the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and is found in the collections of Microsoft, Scotiabank, Polygon, and others. Annie is currently a lecturer in photography and media arts right here at ECU. On the right-hand side, we have Trista Seliger. Trista is a Vancouver artist and high school teacher. Her active art practice includes collages, murals, paintings, and sculptures created in her arts factory studio. Trista predominantly explores ideas and metaphors around mapping as a tool of perception and orientation. In her newest abstract painting, she explores shape, color, and form influenced by the pathways waters, water creates, water and creatures create on the land. These artworks are color field paintings that explore movement, transparency, and opaque layers shifting across a plane. Tristes hosts a YouTube artist talk and assignment series called Studio to Studio. In this series, she interviews talented artists who give us insights into their practices and assigns a creative project. The series started during the pandemic and has kept going. And in the middle, we have Justin Ogilvie. Justin's practice examines various rifts between traditional and contemporary modes of painting, weaving together pictorial explorations that hover between figuration and abstraction. He received an MFA from the University of Alberta and a BFA from Emily Carr University. A devoted instructor since 2000, Justin teaches privately and publicly. In 2019, he co-founded Canvas Method, a contemporary atelier, a Vancouver-based art school with in-person and online classes, as well as mentoring programs for aspiring artists. Justin exhibits nationally and internationally within commercial, municipal, and artist-run center galleries, is part of private and public art collections, and is the recipient of numerous awards. I'm very excited to have all three of these panelists here. <laughs> And I'm going to start by allowing these panelists to talk a little bit more about their practices, starting with Annie. <laughs> thank, God for you. Um, thank you. Oh, I can probably project loud, but I guess for Zoom. it's for Zoom. For Zoom. <laughs> Hi, Zoomers. Um, thanks everyone for being here. It's always nice to have the opportunity to. Um, yeah, to talk about these things, professional uh, kind of opportunities or careers as an artist is something that um, I feel like, you know, because there's no real straight path, um, it becomes kind of complicated to figure out what you're going to do, which direction you're going to take. And so I think these conversations are really important. Uh, and I'm glad to be here. Um, part of it. Uh, Sarah already gave a bio. Thank you, Sarah. So I don't know. Um, how much I'll add on my own practice. Uh, I, can, I can kind of inflect uh, other points as we go, but maybe I'll tell you a little bit how I came into uh, teaching and yeah, how that's working out. And then we can kind of follow up uh, on that. You'll tell from my accent probably soon, if not already, I'm from uh, Teotihuacan, Montreal uh, in Quebec and moved here just over a decade ago to um, pursue an MFA. 
I had done a BFA at Concordia University. Um, I was working in um, nonprofit organizations, uh, festivals, uh, running um, a magazine that I had started called uh, Les Fleurs du Mal, bilingual international magazine. Uh, anyway, doing basically everything, working commercial galleries too, just trying to do like all the things um, so that I could figure out my place, I guess, in the art world uh, and what, you know, what that would look like. Montreal was awesome because, well, many reasons. It's a great city, uh, but also rent was super cheap. And so I was finishing my BFA and I already had two studios and I thought like, eh, it's not so bad. Um, and then I stupidly moved here. No, I'm joking, but um, <laughs> it was very different. Um, but I did all of these things and then I got to a certain point where I thought, okay, I, I you know, my work is not necessarily saying what I wanted to say. Um, so let's go do an MFA. I came here. Uh, my work completely uh, exploded into a million pieces and I put it all back together um, and it was really, really helpful. It kind of, um, yeah, really, really sort of um, zeroed in on what I was trying to say and was finally actually expressing it to people. So that was really nice. And then um, I never really thought about teaching. My mother was a, a elementary school teacher. So I guess I had already seen how kind of all-encompassing and stressful it was. Uh, I don't know how they do it, running around kids all day and then taking that home and then they have their own homework to do. I wanted no part of that. Um, but I had the opportunity to TA uh, for somebody, uh, I guess just, just after my master's, um, and I realized how much I loved it. It was a cultural theory course and I could see the change sort of happen real time um, in my students' kind of uh, perspectives on the world, uh, society, politics, and that was just so hugely inspiring to me. And I, I remember thinking, um, you know, what a privilege to be able to have these conversations and to be able to kind of um, learn what everybody's goals and dreams and, and visions were for the world and for their future. So that's kind of it. I got into teaching. Uh, I've been teaching at Emily Carr, I guess, ever since. I also taught um, at Kwantlen University for a couple of years. And um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a lecturer here. We can talk about what that means <laughs> later. It's a hierarchical uh, tiered structure in uh, academia. And so we can, we can go into that because I know some of you were kind of curious about how that might look. Mm. Yeah, I teach photo, video, sometimes professional practice, and uh, lots of other things uh, that I'm excited and passionate about. I think maybe that's a good start, hopefully. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much, Annie. Up next is Tristess. <laughs> so I'm at, what question am I at? You are just going to talk a little bit more about your practice. You can address the images on the screen if you'd like. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Trista Seeliger, and um, I have been a high school teacher for 23 years. Um, I graduated from Emily Carr, and um, at the time that I graduated, I I had a big student loan, and um, and I couldn't imagine being an artist at that time, I was, I, you know, I, I didn't, I don't really come from, didn't have much support. I, I basically uh, paid for my way through school and I'm like one of the first people in my family to ever have gotten a degree. So um, I quickly um, felt like I had to make some very practical decisions about money and, and um, supporting myself. So uh, I grew up with teachers um, and so I, uh, could really see, well, I, I, I was adopted by teachers. So I was, um, I could see what teaching was like from the inside out living with, um, these really great people. And, uh, I felt like it was something I could do. I felt like I, uh, I've always really been interested in being with people and I get energized by people. And I think that was, um, a good start. So practically I just sort of headed in that direction. I, um, uh, took some time off and taught English in Seoul, Korea for a year. And then I, I realized like I could do it and, um, came back and then did my, uh, professional development year at SFU and, um, and also a minor in English. So I had two teachable subjects 
And then um, uh, I did, yeah, my professional development year. And, and then I basically started teaching about a year after I graduated and, um, and taught for about 12 years. And then I had a major life change that happened that kind of woke me up to the fact that life ends and that I needed to, um, you know, live my life, uh, the way that I wanted to. And, uh, my husband and I decided like that I should go part-time and, um, and then devote a lot of, a lot more time to be, you know, being an artist, practicing art. And so, um, Actually, the life thing that happened to me was that I was diagnosed with cancer and went through cancer treatment. So um, it was like a real shock and a real wake up call. But in a lot of ways, it um, really pushed me into having a, enough courage to to make art, because I think um, making art is is uh, and calling yourself an artist is really challenging, like um, making that leap. For me, it was so. I mustered up the courage to do that. And, um, I have a very supportive husband and I, um, I found art making was, uh, incredibly important to, to going through that experience. And I developed a whole set of map collages, like a, a series of map collages during that. And, and then they start to get some attention. And so then, um, and then ever since then, I, I got a studio, I called myself an artist, I made myself a website, I practice art regularly, like I, I work part time and then I go to my studio. Um, so my practice is very current and um, it's just a part of my routine. And then just things kind of just rolled from there. Like I started to get a lot of um you know, gal you know, galleries asked me to be a part of shows and um, I was asked to be a part of the mural festival and it just kind of rolled along. And so my experience with art has been a lot less, um, or being an artist has been a lot less sort of um, planned out. It's, it's just how things have kind of rolled out for me. But I um, love it and I continue to want to grow and, and, uh, and it's just been a really important decision for me to make as a as a person, as a human. So, uh, my practice is um, that Erin is actually that that person right there is at the school, um, but she was uh, my student last year. Um, anyways, uh, yeah. So I yeah I don't know. Maybe that's thank it. you, Tristus. And Justin. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be here with these two great people and great artists. Um, so my journey, I graduated from Emily Carr in 99, 1999, 2000. Wow, time flies. And um, really soon after graduating, I was approached by this local artist. She had like a, an art studio where she ran workshops for kind of hobby artists. And uh, she was like, I'll pay 20 bucks an hour if you come in and teach a figure drawing class. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, like, yes, yes. That was my first, and that was like a lot of money at the time for me, and it probably still is anyway. So um, I took that opportunity, and um, once I got in there, I discovered that not only did I enjoy teaching, I didn't know that either. You guys didn't know. I didn't know I was going to enjoy teaching. And um, when I got in there, it was like a little um, uh, entrepreneurial side of me came out where I'm like, well, I can also teach abstract painting. I can also teach, you know, uh, abstract background or collage classes or portfolio development. And within six months, I was teaching five different courses at this little cute design shop, this lady Marine. And uh, that was the beginning of my teaching career. And I used to serve tables in the summer to, you know, make money to, so that I could help fund my time while I was in school. And, um, and teaching became a better version of that. That was a better job than serving tables. And uh, so teaching for me, um, doing these kind of private classes outside of the school context was just a means of income and allowed me more time and freedom to be in the studio to paint. Because that's what it's all about. Maximizing the amount of time, free time, like free mental time. So you don't have to think about groceries and taxes and insurance and all the stuff that I'm currently thinking a lot about today, actually. <laughs> So um, anyway, um, yeah, so teaching became part of my path to make money and it was um, integrated, it integrated its way into the way I thought about making art. 
So it informed my art practice, which was surprising. And I'm sure everyone here can relate to that. You, you want to learn something, teach it or write a book, you know, on a topic you don't know about, you learn everything about it. And, uh, so, you know, where do I go? I mean, there's so many things to talk about. It's just like, when did you start? Oh yeah, canvas method. Yeah, there's that. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> before before I do that, uh, maybe like so. Once I was doing this private stuff with this little place, eventually I was like, well, I should apply to teach at Emily Carr. You know, you reject it until you have a master's degree, and so I just did the continuing studies, and then eventually I got my master's so I could teach at Emily Carr. Taught at Emily Carr for a while, and uh, that was great. I loved it. It's kind of like the dream, right? You got all these students that are ready to to go for it and uh, you can mold all of our minds together. Wow. And um, yeah, and then eventually I taught at Vancouver Film School. And when you do your master's, you teach, uh, taught at University of Alberta. And, um, and there was something I liked about the freedom of the independent classes that wasn't available within the university context, which is to say for me, to keep like to simplify it i found that at university there was a very big focus on conceptual practices and there was a little bit missing as far as the technical side of say drawing and painting mm -hmm. i have a master's degree in painting but i've never been taught technically how to draw or paint i'm self-taught and that's great i actually like that but i do think i'm one of the lucky few who had the kind of tenacity to figure that stuff out you know um, a lot of people they kind of quit that and they, do other things and become a dental surgeon or something. I don't know. Um, so I became very interested with independent classes where I could bring technical into the focus as well as conceptual. And then as my career advanced as an artist, I came from kind of a love of the old, like traditional kind of old masters Renaissance stuff. I have a, my first muse was the human body. Life drawing class changed my life. That first class and first day of art school was like, wow, I just want to draw the body. And then eventually that ship sailed and it became more quote unquote contemporary, right? And um, conceptual practices and creative practices, bringing all those together. So technical, creative and conceptual, I wanted to weave that all into one class, not have them so segregated. So I created in 2019, this uh, private little school called Canvas Method. Has anybody heard of Canvas Method? No, the marketing has got to improve, I see. <laughs> Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's the, we offer classes seven days a week, kind of like small classes, 10 students at a time. And um, the idea initially was for me to have all my dream students and we could just go on a journey together. But now I'm not even teaching that much. I hire teachers. I bring in local talent to come in and teach classes and they're sharing their gifts with the students, which is really amazing. So my life now is more like a businessman. I'm sitting on the computer, like hiring people, dealing with customer complaints and it's uh it's not great that part of the business <laughs> but um but talk about a learning curve and like it or not it's informing the way i think about art and it's informing the way i think about life and uh, it's all very valuable so anyway i think um that's the business side all that aside i love painting and i love drawing and that's all there is to it it's that simple thank you so much justin so we'll begin with some questions and you've touched a little bit on like the basics that you took in school but i'd like you to expand on what the programs offered you in terms of additional education or training that was required for you to either operate your business, to teach in a university. You've all touched on the MFA, but maybe sharing a little bit more about that. And Trista sharing more about the program you took at SFU. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's asking me. Um, yeah, what did I learn in school? I have I have feelings uh, about that. Uh, no, I I I was really lucky in um, at Concordia. I received you know very good education, at least with regards to like all of the critical you know what Justin was just talking about, like that kind of conceptual and critical sort of pathways. Um, in Quebec, there's a weird system. It's not well. It's different. From here, instead of having foundation year, you basically finish high school at like 16, and then you go as a 16 year old um, <laughs> to college. And it's like a two year program, but it's 
it's by and large, it's it's like a university. It's called Sejep. Um, the idea is you stay two years, but sometimes people stay there for a really long time because it's um it's exciting and it's free. Um, so it's kind of easy to stay there. Anyway, um, I had essentially done. Uh, I guess the equivalent of like foundation and first year there. I was focusing mostly on painting and drawing um, and then uh, finished up in performance somehow. I, I don't know why, but anyway, that happened. And then when I when I applied to go for my BFA, um, they like wouldn't recognize the credits that I had in painting and drawing. And so I thought, well, I don't wanna do all this all over again. In hindsight, it probably would have been fine and I would have just continued to get better. Um, I'm not an amazing painter, but um, anyway, I ended up saying, well, if I have to redo this, then I'm just gonna go into video art. And that's when it kind of really, things really shifted uh, for me. I started doing lots of handmade animation, weird experimental video stuff, um, and that was great. Uh, but I was always a little bit anxious as to how it would work when I got out of school. Like, how was I going to pay the bills, even though they weren't that expensive in Montreal? There were still bills. Um, you know, how how was I going to do that? I was um, I was bartending uh, quite a bit, and so that was that was fun. But I could see that I was going to crash and burn pretty rapidly doing that. It was not something I could have done long term. And so I started, yeah, uh, I, I guess the, the, the education that I received that was really helpful for me in terms of like how to be an artist and how to, yeah, like operate a, a career um, was the kind of extracurricular stuff that I did on my own, like launching a magazine, um, volunteering for absolutely everything I could possibly volunteer for. I curated a festival while I was there. I curated uh, many shows. Um, I, I was like the arts editor for the, the school paper, like all of these weird things that I had no experience or real necessarily like desire to get into, but just to kind of figure it out. And I remember we had no professional practice class and that's part of why I, I was teaching that um, for quite some time here at Emily Carr, because I really believe in that, like just letting people understand what some of the opportunities are and how to get there. And I remember we were selling like raffle tickets um, for like bottles of whiskey to like faculty members so that we could fundraise to afford bringing in artists to have these kinds of conversations with us. Um, so, so that was kind of, I guess, the education. Then I came, I did my MFA. Um, lovely people really helped me center my practice critically. But in terms of teaching, um, the education that I received was by, yeah, TAing for... Um, this uh, incredible um, theorist and uh, sessional instructor, Magnolia Parker, uh, just really, yeah, I can see some uh, some clapping and some smiles. Yeah, just a beautiful person and such a generous uh, teacher. And in a way, she kind of mentored me um, through sort of teaching and, and how to go about it. So, yeah. Okay. So um, the question is, uh, like, what, how, what kind of education do you need to get into teaching? Is that, and then what the experience is? Okay, so um, I did my Bachelor of Fine Art here at Emily Carr, and then um, I did a minor at SFU in English. And if you're interested in, at all in going into secondary education, so being a high school teacher, which is what I do, um, it's so, so important if you want to teach art to have another teachable subject. So I just feel like I really need to pass that piece of information on to you. Um, you often will apply for jobs where they have like multiple subject areas attached to art. So it's very important if you speak another language or... Um, if you have skills, if you love English as well as, I mean, we we have multiple, we're multi-passionate in lots of areas, film studies, photography, like all these areas. Um, it's so important to, to um, continue to learn about those things as well. And also think about, you know, multiple subjects that you might want to teach if you're interested in going into secondary. So um, I did English. Um, but I also actually did a film degree here, and I'm I'm self-taught in terms of painting um, and and visual art as well in a, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and I also like think the whole professional practices of being an artist um, is 
something that I didn't get at all when I was at Emily Carr, but um, really, really dove into uh, in terms of like entrepreneurial skills. Um, so I don't know what they're offering here right now in regards to that stuff, but um, it's super important to, to understand that like art, there's a business aspect to being an artist and having those skills is super important. And as a, as a teacher, um, how, if you wanted to go into high school teaching, it's super important to probably have more than one teachable subject. Um, also, I want to say that you really, really need to get in front of, if you're interested in being a teacher in any shape, way or form and any of the ways that you see up here, then you need to get in front of some people and teach them and see how that makes you feel because um, it is not for everybody. Um, I, I have taught many, many student teachers over the years and I have watched people fall apart. Um, and it's because mostly um, that they had... Uh, you know, or it, it, I think it's in multiple things, but I think people get into teaching because it's a it's a profession that uh, is like a doctor, a teacher. You know, people talk about it. It's understood what it is. Being an artist is totally misunderstood. Like people just don't know what artists do. Like, well, how is that a thing, really? Like, how is that a job? And so that's the professional practices aspect that you have to really like um, try to. Uh, you know, teach yourself about, but um, uh, yeah. So I think a lot of people choose to, to go into teaching because it's just something that they understand as a profession. But you need to embody it a little bit before you 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 really go into it because it is it is no joke, <laughs> especially at the high school level. <laughs> you yeah, know, it scares it puts the fear into people the high school level but it's actually like I really love it and it's amazing and my students are totally amazing and I and I and I'm honored to to do it but but I have watched uh, a lot of people crumble um very quickly <laughs> that's great so we have like high school teacher university and then teaching independent private classes yeah. it's such a nice spread yeah well selected <laughs> well thought yeah um, I always think of a painting teacher, at least in the context that I teach, um, is, is like I'm a psychologist with a brush. And um, I'm sure you guys can relate to that. Sometimes you feel like you're having a bit of a breakdown and your teacher is kind of helping you along the way or vice versa, maybe. But um, that'd be funny. Eh? Teacher's breaking down. It's OK. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you learn on the job. That's the best lesson for sure. Um, I you know, in doing my master's, part of the master's program. How many of you guys are thinking of doing master's programs? Yeah. And is there anybody here that already knows, or at least is questioning if teaching is a, a thing for you guys? And then how many know for sure teaching is a thing? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely like, I like what you were saying, Tristis, about just, it's uh, one thing in your mind and then you go do it. It's another. Having to really care about people. That's tough. And if you're naturally empathic, it's okay. <laughs> and um, I, I discovered early on that I, I, I love people and I actually believe in people and I actually believe that I can teach people and I can help guide people. You know, like I have that in me. It's like natural. I'm eldest brother, probably it's part of that dynamic, who knows. But um, so that helped a lot. And then as a result of that, it would get in people's faces when it mattered and I would make them take a stand when it mattered. And then, or I would back off and let them take the path when it mattered, you know? So, and I've heard people, I've had people yell at me and uh, people leave class and I've had people cry, I've cried, you know? So it's not always like on the couch, you know, in class, or like you're in a psychology thing, but, uh, um, but it's always there in the background. And when you're dealing with people's creativity, you're dealing with people's egos. And so part of my training as a teacher has been, um, I guess, learning about myself as a human being, overcoming my own, problems and challenges within my family um, and doing personal development. I've done, you know, in my early 20s, I did a bunch of that self-help, you know, you read those self-help books. I was like addicted to that stuff. My language was like laden with that annoying, you know, I got to maximize myself, you know. I have a, an elderly friend who used to tell me to shut up all the time. 
and um and then that ship sailed and then i got quiet and just lived life and um and then i got into more spirituality and as an artist i was interested in the human body so i got into yoga and uh, had a background in playing sports a lot so you you know you start learning about all these things and you bring that into your teaching so you know in the middle of class i noticed the energy is low i'm like everybody outside we're gonna do some stretches you know stuff like that um or practices that i can uh su suggest that exercises i can give to them to help them warm up before they do their real work i have this whole thing called uh, i'm allowed to swear here buckets so i have this practice called buckets and it's like a warm-up before you get down to do the real work and I, I did that um, because I'm a re recovering perfectionist. You know, I'm, I'm the opposite of loose. So I spent my whole career as an artist learning how to loosen up. And so all those little fuck it exercises, they actually became my serious work and all the serious work disappeared. So now I'm committed to play and letting loose. That's like everything for me. Uh, and then, so that's where I teach from. So I think as a teacher, the students teach you and what you teach, in the word teach too much it's like it just it informs your practice and um watching light bulbs go off in people's eyes and that's the cool thing about teaching is like you can change people's direction and path in life i had a friend who was a lawyer he became a painter he just left it all and he moved to europe and that's a whole other story and, and i'm like i'm sorry or you're welcome i'm not sure which one it is um i used to do a lot of like uh, almost like field work I, I i used to go to the morgue to study human bodies uh for anatomy and uh, i thought it was going to be one kind of experience and i got there and it was a totally different experience soaked it in and i went back multiple times and then i used to explore like topics like because we're visual artists like the subject of blindness and how does imagery exist in the minds of the blind for example so i started exploring blindness and i started exploring all these topics but i would put myself into it kind of like intensely and then I would come out of it and then I would teach from that place so I, I put myself through these tests all the time I'm not too crazy I don't do like crazy awesome performative work too much but uh, so those experiences teach me a lot about how to teach but um, I don't know how to answer the question other than life teaches you everything you need to know and the students teach you how to teach and um, trial and error kind of thing and then yeah but you know that's a great thing about when you teach in high school you have to go learn about pedagogy and my brother teaches in um, high school and he's one of the most committed teachers I've ever seen. He did his master's in education and they learn all these various models of pedagogy and it's incredible listening to him talk. I'm like, wow, you're really committed to like teaching people, you know, mm -hmm. it's a whole other level. So, but I'm just trying to show people how to paint and have a good time. So it's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, is that good? That's amazing. I think I Thank talked you. to him. Sorry about that. So the next question I have is, how do you keep your practice alive during your day job? And how do you ensure you have enough creative energy to maintain that art practice when you're also sharing it with all of your students? Yes. Um, thanks, Sarah. I feel like you and I have maybe talked about that as well <laughs> in the past. Um, energy. Uh, right now I have a two-year-old toddler, uh, so energy is a whole other <laughs> situation. Uh, he did not let me sleep much last night. Um, that's okay. He's, he's cute and sweet, uh, so it's, it's all right. Um, yeah, day job. Well, I think, I think for me, part of the, um, okay, so it's, it's sort of, I think, I think I'm, I'm this person that kind of, um, <laughs> How do I say it in a non-negative? I almost said like two-faced or two-sided, but that's that's not true. That's no um, multifaceted. I, yeah, I don't know. I I think. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's more with regards to energies, right? Like I can be extremely um, extroverted, and recently I've been uh, going. There's the, there's so many more openings now, and they're so huge, and so many people, and it's a party, and I'm like, yes, I'm there for it. I love it. I'm just feeding up like I feel like a vampire I'm just going and I'm like Shh, give me your energy um so so that's been really great but then en revanche like the other side is is you know this introversion that I think a lot of us have as artists as well of just needing to have that time and space and quiet so that you can actually um think and and make right 
and so when I when I had finished my BFA, um, I was I was like I said quite fortunate. Um, I got gallery representation right away, and so and and a couple of grants and things. So I was able actually to just take a year as a full time artist in the studio. I wasn't selling anything. So it didn't you know um, didn't didn't work out that well, but um, but I could have um, I could have kind of kept kept going that way. I, I was just, um, I was miserable. Just being in the studio full time, all the time, I was miserable uh, because I think I was lacking that energy, right? Of the people and the interaction. Um, and so then I kind of went the absolute opposite way. I started running um, festivals and nonprofits and being on all these boards. And then it was the total opposite life of just, you know, you're hired for 30 hours a week and it's really 50 hours a week, but you're just paid for 30 hours a week, like that kind of thing. If any of you have done the nonprofit stuff, you know, um, but then I realized, oh, I'm like this, I'm really miserable too. Like this is not working. Um, and so for me, what works best is this sort of, um, a little bit like what Tristesse was saying, I think, like this kind of part-time um, approach with the teaching so that I have more time and energy uh, in the studio. And then when I do go to the studio, it's, um, you know, it's full on. And I'm 100% there and I'm 100% present as opposed to that year where I was just kind of, I mean, I was doing stuff. I was doing shows and, and you know, I had, I had all kinds of um, uh, shows like internationally. I was traveling. It was fun, but, but there was a lot of wasted time. There was a lot of TV watching. There was a lot of just like having existential crises. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, was, was not the best. Um, but now every time, I mean, especially cause I have a, a toddler now, so every minute counts, but, but the teaching sort of um, allows me to be able to undertake that kind of um, mentor role that's really important to me and that energizes me and that I, I get so much value out of while also offering a kind of structure so that then uh, on my studio days, I do have a lot of energy and focus. Um, so I typically only teach two or three classes a term uh, out of choice so that I have that time for the studio. Every now and then I'll do a term where I'm teaching like a full on, you know, five courses uh, and then it's really hard. I have to hire studio assistants. Uh, I have to do all this other stuff. I don't get to do any of the fun work in the studio. I have to kind of pay other people to do it because I don't have time. And then I realize my energies are not, yeah, that that kind of creeping, like I'm not feeling so happy and energetic starts coming back. So yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to hear your stories because I think there's a lot of crossover in a lot of ways. I um so I think that life uh, often you'll you'll get into something you'll get a teaching job. I I you know for me I I worked full time for 12 years, and and for me teaching full time in a high school was like you know I was the department head. I had um you know a full course load. I was running clubs. But it was, um, I wasn't happy, like, um, and then, you know, this event happened and I um, then had the courage to really sort of follow my art career. So I think we all have personal um, experiences that, and you're going to have your own kind of path to follow. But um, I've had a, kind of a similar experience in that then I was able to kind of work with art and and dive into art. And it, it actually kind of exploded for me in the first couple of years that I um, was making art sort of and calling myself an artist. I got a lot of like attention and, um, and then I sort of realized like that was, that felt, um, it was a, it got a, bit, a bit overwhelming. And now I feel like I'm getting to a point after like being an artist or practicing art for about 12 or no, 10 years now, I, feel like I'm getting into a rhythm that is good for me. So I think we all have our, um, you know, you, you kind of dive deep into something and then you'll realize where their, your boundary is in terms of like, um, how to make it work for you. And that's, and, and I think there's a, something really wise about the introvert extrovert thing is that I, for me personally too, I think teaching really grounds me. It's, I go, I I'm dealing with, you know, 
great, you know, great people, young people that um, represent a lot of hope and the future. And it's very, it's just like a grounding kind of um, um, state to be in. And then going to the studio can be very open. It's like when you are responsible to um, set your own criteria and come up with work that can be very overwhelming and it's also isolating. So for me, it's like a really nice balance to have those two things in my life. And I'm fortunate that I am in a circumstance where I can do that. Um, so uh, maintaining a practice is actually really easy for me because it's kind of almost like uh, my wellness routine. Like I go into the studio and, and just fooling around and working and being with artists. Like I love being around artists. It's like, you are my weirdos. You know, I love, <laughs> you know, like the, the, it is my, it is my people. So teaching in my sphere at, uh, at the secondary level is quite conservative. And so I have always, you know, or it tends to be more conservative. And so I've always, um, you know, not quite identified with that tribe. And so having artists and, and being creative and being around people that are doing interesting things has been really important for me. So, um, yeah, for me, it's like, I just go in the way I maintain my practices. I, I practice. And I, when I've read about other people's, uh, creative practices, you know, other, you know, you've, there's lots of books about how other people have, you know, writers, filmmakers, um, artists, visual artists, and so on. It's usually that they they just go in and, and just do the work, even if they don't feel like it. So it's like really a practice. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, yeah, for me, this question relates to artist block or what happens when you're, you know, you're, you're having a hard time to use the phrase drink to keep drinking the Kool-Aid or you lose faith or you're like, you know what I mean? Like, am I making pictures to hang above rich people's couches? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of times, for example, or, or is this idea of block, you know, I'm exploring squares right now and just blocking squares with color. It's like the stupidest idea and I'm totally into it. But then sometimes I'm like, is it stupid? I think it's still stuff, you know? So, and then, keeping your energy while you're teaching, you know, you put all this energy out, how do you keep your energy in? Right. So that whole life work balance thing. Um, so it relates for me anyway, this question to artist block, or how do you deal with the psychological tools to keep you physically present? You know, that famous saying from Chuck Close, uh, is something, something to the effect about inspiration. It's like, uh, it starts every morning at 9am be there. Um, or inspiration is for beginners, you know, so in other words, it's just uh, don't wait for the inspiration. It's all about just showing up and being there. You can heroicize the whole work hard thing, but it's really just being there. You know, it's a relationship. And um, so for me as an artist, I recognized, and I want to throw something else out there. Um, when I was an undergrad in school, I was super committed to becoming technically good at drawing the human figure for whatever reason. It was a, a bad idea. When I look back at... I'm 47 now. When I was 24, the difference between my talent level then and where I'm at now is actually like this. But I spent the last 30 years trying to get better. And what I didn't know then, which I wish I knew now is then, is that I was good enough back then and I could have focused on more conceptual practices. But I was so technically, I had a weird hang up. Like, did you think to be good at that? I did say I was a recovering perfectionist. Uh, yeah, for me, I had a certain vision and I was miles away from it. But now looking back, I was actually good enough to participate in contemporary figurative painting because contemporary figurative painting now, it's it's more about not traditional approaches to representation, but coming up with your own problems and coming up with your own solutions, right? Uh, Dana Schutz, you guys know Dana Schutz, for example, anybody? Come on, you guys, you got to know Dana Schutz. Anyway, um, so it's, and that's what art school taught me. That's what Emily Carr taught me. It's like the most talented people are sometimes vi like visibly the less talented, you know, they're, they're creative in other ways. And um, I'm getting a little bit off track here. Oh yeah. So I came out of school having this technical skill and that's what got me the job to be able to teach. So if I had any kind of advice, if you guys are interested in like maybe not teaching in the university context, but you want to survive in teaching independently, 
is to become really damn good at some technical thing so that people pay you money to do it. So for example, if I teach a workshop, this is going, I've been doing this for the last 20 years. I would teach a two day workshop to 10 people and I'd make about $3,000 in two days. And then I would only have to teach one weekend per month so that I could guess what I could do for the rest of the month. I live with roommates, so I keep all my expenses down. I haven't bought clothes in years. And, um, and then you just, it's not the same clothes for 20 years, but <laughs> my wife keeps me in check anyway. Um, and then, and then, so it was this really beautiful life work balance where I could teach for two days and then I could live for the rest of the month and then just paint full time. And then once in a while I would teach two classes and then it's like, Oh, I have enough money maybe to go to Seattle or go see some art museums or something. So, um, in other words, get paid too much money for the time that you're spending working. Like, how can you do that? $16 an hour is what I made when I served tables. Um, that was fine. It was great at the time. And then, and then, and then I decided one time to start commercial fishing in the summers, which ethically has a lot of problems, but it paid the bills. And I did that for five years. I spent a whole year on the sea uh, doing commercial fishing. And I come back from that very kind of blue collared lumberjack mode of thinking to like high minded, you know, art. My hands are all blistered and stuff. And um, so the live work balance, um, the energy. Yeah, it's too much to answer. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I think I think you did like, great. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question before we open this up to the floor for any questions among the audience, including our Zoom attendees, is what is something you wish you knew about teaching that you would tell your younger self? And what advice would you give to somebody looking to pursue teaching? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I actually canvassed all of the teachers in uh, Vancouver, the art teachers about like, what do I need to tell you people? And um, here's the list. Yeah. So teaching is really a service job. You are in the service of your students and are responsible in part for getting them through. You can't pick and choose your students. Everyone is allowed to go to school and you should ask yourself if you like people. Hope is a discipline. Um, I got that from my principal today and uh, I love her. She's an amazing um, person. And I do believe that it is our responsibility as teachers to give hope to people. Um, Teaching is incredibly rewarding. It is a long game in that you affect people and might not find out how much for years. You can change the course of a person's life. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why I actually think that, you know, it gives you strength when you're having a really difficult time to get up in the morning um, because of that, that you can actually affect people. Um, develop a self-care routine. <laughs> as teaching demands a lot of energy and the need can be endless. This is gonna probably spark some ideas for you guys too. Um, we have a responsibility to fill in the areas of history that have been ignored, give teaching space to indigenous ways of learning, BIPOC artists and their histories. And there's probably stuff I'm leaving out there. Um, you really need to be honest with yourself about your disp disposition and energy. Are you comfortable being in front of people and leading? Do you have patience? I have taught many students, and I told you this already, that have, um, many student teachers that have really had a hard time. And, uh, and you don't want to spend too much time putting energy into this profession if it's not for you. And you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Um, the best way to control a class is to know your stuff and feel or energized and excited by the subject matter. If you continue to teach a subject for a long time, you need to constantly adapt and change. In high school, there's a lot of people that are just calling it in and we've all had those teachers. And if it's boring for you, that translates into the students. Um, my principal also said, it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, I highly recommend that you teach a few classes before you go into teaching, um, like teach your 
parents how to do something, um, get feedback from them. It's like, give it a try. Um, sorry, you guys, I just wrote down all this stuff. <laughs> um, okay, when you do the professional development year, year uh, um, for, for secondary teaching or um, elementary teaching, um, don't do anything else. It is demanding. Um, it is important to follow codes of conduct. The community is small and gossip and behaviors are noticed. So treat your colleagues with respect, even if you don't like them. Um, make friends with the custodians and the office staff. They are very powerful. <laughs> That's, my That's awesome. Do you want to come with me? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Sarah kindly sent us these uh, questions ahead of time, but I guess we were all, uh, I don't know, had our tunnel, tunnel vision uh, in the studio. Yeah, I shouldn't say all, me. I'll speak for myself. Um, thank you, Tristess. So a couple of things. Um, I'd love to just, um, yeah, respond to one of the one of the things that you brought up, uh, especially within higher ed. Um, we talk about decolonization so much now. It's become, you know, a big kind of buzzword, uh, which is great because it's something that we need to think about. But it's rare that it's sort of enacted, uh, you know, within the curriculum. It's one thing to um, sort of disrupt the canon and bring in voices that have been, you know, maybe kind of um, cast aside or obfuscated or just not kind of given that, uh, that central space. That's super, super important. But in terms of teaching uh, practices, beyond that, I think it also extends to how um, we expect people to learn and the kinds of activities we expect them to do and the deliverables that we ask of them. Um, so this is, you know, I don't know if this extends to all areas of teaching, but certainly within higher ed, uh, for myself, something that I've done is give students uh, numerous different options in terms of how they do the work. Um, I've let students turn in, you know, uh, comic books, uh, animated videos, uh, now Zoom's a thing, so everybody's doing like video lectures, but we weren't doing that um, when I started. And kind of letting them turn in a paper that way, if that's something that's more comfortable to them. And so I think that if, um, and, and you know, we, we keep sort of trying to move into that direction so that the institution isn't just kind of, you know, pressing everybody into a mold and then letting them go and okay great now you all sort of speak the same language and are doing the exact same thing or working in the same style and so i think that um that's something maybe to to think about right are you are you willing to kind of have that diligence and be creative with regards to um sort of yeah disrupting maybe the system a little bit and changing things up but also seeing students uh as as um yeah as individuals and and kind of thinking that through a little bit. Um, then the other the other part of it, I don't know, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying some of these things. Should I do it? I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, this is again with regards to higher ed uh, in particular. I've also I've also done um, I think Tristess was saying teach like like start um, you can do some trial kind of teaching. And so I think uh, many community centers and uh, municipal galleries are always looking for artists to do some kind of a workshop or facilitate something. So those can be really great places to try. You don't need an MFA for that. Uh, you don't even need a BFA, but if you have the BFA, it certainly helps you know, uh, give, give that extra oomph uh, and, and credence uh, when, you're, when you're kind of applying. But those are all great opportunities. I've done that as well. Higher ed, um, like I said before, there's really like a hierarchy structure. And um, for me, it wasn't really made clear, I guess, like the economics of it. Now that I think of it, I'm like, what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> we graduate about 450 students from the BFA programs every year. Uh, at Emily Carr. I know that because I used to um, manage the grad show and it was nuts. It was so many, so many people, so much art. It was great. Um, but then if you think of that, right, like if, if let's say, I don't know, let's say um, 
10% of those people or a quarter of those people go and take an MFA because they want to teach. And I'm saying this because I teach in the grad program and a lot of my students, that's when you ask them why they're doing an MFA, that's why they're like, oh, I want to go teach. Like it's a, a golden ticket kind of thing. And unfortunately, the economics don't make sense. If you think of how many people are graduating from a master's program and want to teach, right? It's like, okay, but then wait, like then the, the teacher to student ratio has to be what, like one to one or one to three. It just doesn't make sense. And obviously uh, I'm not math minded uh, <laughs> because I would have realized that. I don't know that I even thought about that. It just, people were encouraging me so much to go into teaching once I realized that I liked it, that I, I didn't quite understand those complexities. Um, it's really hard to get in, right? And then once you're in, um, to get more than, you know, a class here and there is super, super difficult as well. It's extremely competitive. It is not based on how hard you work or how badly you want it or even who you know. There's just so much else at play there as well. And so I guess it's just a little bit of um, a real talk because that's what I'm about. Um, yes, if you're excited to go into teaching higher ed, do it. I'm not trying to rain on your parade. I love it. I'm loving my life. Everything's great. I love my students. It's, you know, it's a happy, happy time. But just be aware that it's not because you get that master's, right, um, that that's naturally going to kind of uh, occur or, or take place. Um, academia is more and more relying on part-time uh, contract workers as opposed to hiring professors. Uh, and we see that. I won't give you the stats for Emily Carr because that's not what I'm here for. But um, <laughs> but it's it's just something to kind of yeah keep uh, keep in mind, be aware of. I think that it used to be a golden goose. Uh, MFA graduates were so limited, but now MFAs have become a way for um, universities to make money. I'm not saying everywhere. I gained a lot from the program. Uh, I thought it was great, and every you know I think. Uh, the few people I, I've spoken to tonight that did MFA seem to love it too. But it's not the only way, exactly. It's not the only way. And um, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't like, yeah. That makes great. <laughs> at, my, at my level, if you want to know what teachers make, it's all online. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, but in terms of like the economics of it, like what, everything that I like is is your like your salary good? Um, yeah. <laughs> like you're saying that it costs a lot of money to, to get your MFA but and it and then you want to be a teacher it's very competitive to get into yeah. the post-secondary world right yeah that that's super important that's important to think about because so I um I we can talk if anybody needs help with scholarships just come see me um, I, I did get like a paid ride for my MFA, so that was fine. But I have a friend who went, I won't say where, it's not in Canada, it's in the States. Mm -hmm. She graduated with $350,000 US of debt from her MFA. And now she's been out five years, still has not been able to get even a sessional teaching role. Uh, so that's really, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have to approach the. You have to approach it like with. Um, you hear me? Like I think you, you can approach these things with different. Like my, I have a son that's nineteen, and he's thinking about getting his um, welding ticket. But he also is a wants to be an artist as well, and so he could like here in a year from now, and then be able to like probably afford to do. So there's like different ways to get where you're going, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was perfect. Everything you guys said, that was really great. Um, I was actually wanting to say a lot of that stuff, but because I don't teach her currently, I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't go there. So uh, yeah, thank you for saying it for me. That's ah, okay. Nobody saw it. Hi. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. One piece of advice I'd give to people uh, is to go speak to people who are currently in that industry. Like don't, live in your imagination there's going to be this and that just go speak to the people so when i was doing my uh masters in edmonton at uh, university of alberta i speak spoke to a bunch of higher ups i'm like so tell me the truth what's it like in a full-time teaching position 
And they're like, it's one third, one third, one third. You get one third for teaching, one third for uh, your own practice, and then one third for all the extra community-based things to service and such for the for the university itself. I'm like, what the hell is that? What's service? Or and then I'm like, how much do you actually get to do your own work? So you start, you know, and it, when I interviewed a few instructors, it was like, oh, I'm not going to actually get to do my own work that much. Yeah, you get fairly good pay, good, you know benefits and security that's the real issue here how many of you are freaking out because of issues of security not you guys but in general um so your relationship to security and your relationship to insecurity is usually what's the issue that's what it's about and being an artist you have to be comfortable in that insecurity position not to the point of self-collapse but so that's a different conversation um so when I discovered through my interviews of teachers that uh, it was not in alignment with how I want to live my life, I want to be with a bottle of wine in my studio making money passively while I'm in Mexico painting on a freaking mural or something like that. Continuous. You're all welcome to come. <laughs> yeah, like I just, I just, just want to paint. It's that old, uh, it's just simple that way. Just paint, you know, that's the dream, right? Anyway, for me. So... Uh, talk to people who are already doing it, have a lot of experience, and ask them the hard questions, the ones that you're afraid to ask. Those are the ones you want to ask. You and, ask those yeah. Good, yeah. Yeah, it's really great. And then you hear things you don't want to hear. Bubbles pop. It's reality check. And you're, ah, okay. So um, that would be that. And then as far as that, so that's the institutional teaching. And the question was like advice this, regarding. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a, there, what would you tell your younger self about teaching that you wish you knew? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say when I was young, the dream of having my own class was what it was all about. Like that kind of like you're, 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 you know, you get to all work together. And uh, that ship sailed after about two years of teaching. And then all these people became a pain in the ass. I'm joking. But it became a real job. Like we had to really service these people. It was a service thing. It was a service thing. And then I was like, oh, this isn't about you, Justin. This isn't about me and my dream. It's about giving something to these people. And I felt exhausted after a three hour class. I'm like, how many more of these classes do I have to do? So the fitness, you got to stay wellness. the wellness balance thing. Yeah. 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 So it's like any job. It's exhausting if you don't handle it the right way. So Thank you guys so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're like, wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> so we do have one question on Zoom, and then I'm going to open it up to the rest of the room. And this question is for Justin. For teaching independently, is there a preferred platform for teaching online? Oh, yeah, that's a big question. Obviously now, right? Um, Post-pandemic online education. Um, a preferred platform? No, there's so many competing ones. Um, and it's sorry, it's the question is, is there a preferred platform for? Yeah. I mean, there's just, and, and what's the topic? What's the discipline? Do we know? Painting, drawing, sculpture? Yeah, whatever. I'm assuming yeah. visual arts. I would say Canvas Method Online Art School. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we are creating an online school, but I'm not plugging my piece. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's just so many, it's, it's impossible to answer it. But like New Masters Academy, there's all these institutions. It's drawing. Is, is oh yeah that? right uh yeah i i mean i hate to say it but it's probably the best one out there is proko p-r-o-k-o if you want to learn how to draw things that look like things it's probably the best cheapest most affordable thing out there and if you wanted to teach your own classes if you would to about? teach your own classes like what would you use if he wants to do what i do yeah oh and the advice i'd give him yes Oh, get good at something and get really good at it, like technically, because that's what people are going to pay you for. They're not going to pay you for conceptual stuff, unfortunately. It's the technical, you know, grain of salt, right? Portfolio. But yeah, portfolio development. So yeah, anyway, being blunt, but it's kind of true. And like what online, how do you teach online? Is it just... Oh, yeah. Well, we have, you know, with all these platforms that are out there now, you, you know, you, I sit, I have a camera room where we have four cameras and they're filming me while I'm painting and talking to the camera, mixing my colors and the close up camera. And it's all simultaneous. And, and then I look at the camera. I'm like, hey, everyone, I'm going to show you guys how to paint the face today. We're going to start with gray colors and put color on it. And then we're going to slap a bunch of drips on it. And so it's just all digital. It's just, you know, hire someone who knows how to set it up and just get in front of the camera and go. 
But then that, oh man, getting in front of the camera, that's scary. Hearing your own voice, not good. It's the worst. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. do you upload those on YouTube or do you have a Yeah, so we're in the beginning phases at Canvas Method of creating the online school. And we're going to be hiring teachers abroad, like around the world to do their own uh, lessons from their own studios, as well as we have an in-house studio where we're going to bring teachers in. Um, it's again, my vision is to not make it about me at all, is to get it into the hands of people who like, I don't do watercolors. I don't know how to do still lives. Let's get it to the pros, hire the plumber to do the plumbing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's what's fascinating about online classes too, is that you have those videos forever. So we know when I do a demonstration to a live class, a lot of those students are going to miss what I'm saying, or they're going to forget about it. With the online, you have it for life, those videos. You can always learn those things. And I think that's an advantage with the online. Plus, you're also close to the painting. When I'm demonstrating how to do a tiny thing in an eye, for example, that gets lost when you're six feet, 10 feet behind me. But if you're there with the, the film, right, it's incredible. Those are some advantages, but nothing like the real thing, you know, being in class. Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And for the room, are there any questions? What would you say are some of the factors that helped you break into post-secondary? Breaking into it in terms of like teaching or in terms of getting the MFA teaching? Yeah, um, I, think, I think just passion, right? Um, passion, just, just a deep sort of... Um, uh, yeah, passion or like commitment to uh, making art and to teaching, right? Like, um, I think that an MFA can be problematic if you're taking it strictly because you want to teach, because your work may not evolve very much and you may get, you know, very limited learning from it. But if you take it uh, because you're just super passionate about it, then I think that the rest will kind of come out through that. I think that it can be... Um, I mean, it's been tremendously important for my practice. And then in terms of teaching or breaking into it, um, kind of just being, yeah, doing, being visible a lot, doing a lot of volunteering, um, offering to take on maybe some of the things that other people don't necessarily want to do, like the, you know, TAing or leading seminars, like those things are always kind of, um, they're definitely like a little bit rougher to, to sort of take on. Uh, but doing that, being visible, when I when I started teaching, I was teaching a lot within, um, like I said, I, I, I was kind of teaching everywhere. Like I was doing a class or two here, um, then at Kwantlen, um, people knew that I was teaching the things that I was teaching. And so I was getting calls from yeah, community centers, galleries. And then I was doing that because that then really helps you to build up your CV as well. Um, so I think that showing this is what I always tell my students um, when they're kind of building CVs or thinking about those opportunities is like nobody's expecting you when you're starting out to be um, to be a pro or to be a master of anything. Right. But they are expecting you to be passionate. And so how do you show that passion? It's by yeah teaching and mentoring kind of as much as you can, putting yourself in those situations as much as you can. And then um, when you do then apply, you've already got kind of something more robust than just saying, well, I got my piece, I paid the money, I got my piece of paper, right? Um, and, uh, and focusing on developing your portfolio too. And I think that this is a bit of the catch-22 um, that, that we've all been kind of discussing is that if you want to teach people, people hire you to teach because of your practice, because they find it interesting, either technically proficient or, you know, conceptually interesting, or you've shown all over the place and that's really inspiring to people. So you need to have the time to develop that, right? Uh, so whether that means taking time between the BFA and the master's, uh, I'm a huge, you know, advocate for that. Go live your life and, and see what happens and, and unfolds. Um, yeah, show your passion, take some time. Don't worry too much about getting everything done right then and there and give your time, give, give yourself the time to develop your practice as well. Then the hard thing will be 
they hire you because of your practice, but then you're teaching so much that then, well, when do you do your practice? <laughs> and so, you know, in a way, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. It's all about found, finding balance, but I, I think that's I think that's kind of the case no matter what you do as an artist. It's always like a balancing act, right? Mm. Hello. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if it's working. Um, this is like, I guess, a two-parter question. The first is like, you all have an MFA, is that correct? Yes, yeah? Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> um, what would you say about like getting a master's in a more specific version of sort of MFA? For example, I'm an illustrator. I am looking into getting a master's of illustration. Would you say that that is like, a little bit riskier? Is it better to be more general or is it better to be more specific? Um, and then the second part of this is like not totally related, but I've also heard that like you shouldn't get your master's where you want to teach. Would you say that that is true or would you say that that is a falsehood and a lie? Regarding that last one about uh, like don't do your master's where you want to teach. I think that depends on the school. So at University of Alberta in Edmonton, where I went, a lot of the people who were teaching were graduates of the program. And they had a tighter knit family feeling among the staff there. I'm not sure what the culture is like here at MacArthur. I've been taught here for about eight years. Um, I think maybe do you want to take a crack at that sure. first question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that generally speaking, this again is a catch-22. Everything, I feel like I'm just, everything's like black and white tonight coming out of my mouth. It's all, yeah, it depends. Um, but basically, okay, so on the one hand, if you get a degree elsewhere, right, and then you come and apply, uh, let's say here, right, definitely you'll be... Um, it's not definitely. It depends. But okay, there's there's a certain appeal, right, to bringing in a prof from somewhere else because then they're bringing with them a whole other body of knowledge, right, and other connections and other institutions that that they they kind of can bring in maybe for partnerships and all of that. So there's something really exciting about that that can be very helpful. Um, but the other reality is that we're humans, right? Humans love to as much as it, it, it bothers me how nepotistic the art world is. We're humans. And so it's sort of like this, this is kind of what happens, right? People, people want to bring people in or learn from people that, you know, I don't know. You're like, oh, you also know about, I don't know, the, the culture here, the community here. Like there's, there's an appeal to that. The other thing is, um, yeah, that then you've, you've sort of got a community there. You're comfortable there. Uh, you have ties. So I think that I think that it depends. For me, it was accidental. I wasn't doing a master's thinking in any way about teaching. I was just, I don't know what I was thinking, taking a taking a break from <laughs> being in the studio full time or focusing on commercial stuff. I, I don't know. Um, but it kind of then accidentally happened. I got my master's here. I taught a little bit. And then I just kind of, you know, I left for a few years going, going to Kwantlen. But um, yeah, just kind of kept doing things here. So I I don't know. There's sort of pros and cons to both. Um, I think it also depends on the university you go to, maybe more so than the city. If you go to some small college in the middle of nowhere that nobody's ever heard of in a city that is, you know, just not really a city, uh, then it's, it's going to be hard then to get a job in the city, right? But so kind of thinking about it, yeah, that way. There's the pros and cons. Um, you know, think when when you're applying to a master's, think what uh, what are the criteria do you need? Do you need funding? Do you need connections? Do you need studio space? Do you need uh, mentorship? And sort of pick the ones that are like list them in terms of priority and then make your choices um, kind of that way is right is what I would say. Um, then there was another part to your. Qu oh, yeah. The, the specificity of the degree. I think it's, I, yeah, I feel like I want to say it's better to be broad because, right, because then you have a lot more opportunities and then, um, you know, your practice can develop probably a lot more as well. 
but a lot of universities are still working in silos where they want to hire a specialist in this very particular niche. And so in that case, you know, like if you know that you want to teach illustration, then yeah, why not get an illustration master's? It, it, it can't hurt, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like my first teaching position at Emily Carr uh, after I did my master's was uh, anatomy. And I'm like, oh, big surprise. That's something I specialize in. And uh, I didn't do my master's in anatomy because there's no such thing. That'd be funny <laughs> uh, for drawing. Anyway, um, and then but what I found, I, I wasn't getting teaching positions outside of my specialty. And that was because my practice as an artist didn't engage in those really, you know, boundary pushing all the different disciplines, sort of blurring all those edges. I was like, everything's inside the frame. It's kind of like traditional painting, right? So um, it depends if you want to be a specialist or if you want to be a more interdisciplinary approach, I would say it's like, so I would think that determines what you would do in your masters. That's what I would think, yeah, yeah. Or just do do a masters, just, or just beg the masters and just become an artist and, and, and support your own. Like another way to go about it is don't do the education, <laughs> teach yourself and uh, support your creativity any way that you can. And that's like something that um, uh, I think a lot of people do teach themselves how to make art or just practice art. And so they're, 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 I know a lot of artists that have done that and are doing really well with it. And um, if you become very good at it, they give you honorary degrees. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just like, I'm very much about like, do you think outside the box? There isn't one way to, to there's no one road. And I think um, one of the, one of the kind of scary things about right now is that we, you know, as like white collar workers, we, um, you know, we are at, we hope that our kids go, you know, I have two 19 year olds. I hope, you know, I was like, at first I hope they would go to university, but like, like I said, my, like, if you go into the trades, you, you can do very well and um, support your art in other ways. So I don't, I don't know. I just don't want to, like, I want to say that it's not the only way to go about this, this thing. And especially with art, if you um, if you become very good at something, you're just good at it. You know, like <laughs> you you have that. You will always have that. Yeah, I was just a little bit curious when uh, just uh, what exactly goes into getting a master's. Um, because because I, I've been hearing that term be thrown around, but I'm still like for me personally, I'm just a little bit confused as to what exactly a master's is or what goes into getting one to begin with. So I mean, that's the after your bachelor's degree, you would the next step forward is the master's degree. Um, so and then applying for that position is extremely competitive. Um, for fine artists, it's a lot because all these fine artists require studio spaces and the universities don't have a lot of studio spaces to offer. So in the program I was offered, they offered two positions per year. So, and I applied to 10 schools that got accepted into two. And I thought I was pretty good. What the hell? I'm just joking. But, and uh, it was a two year program and I stayed for three because it was so awesome. The studio was bigger than any studio I'd ever had in my life and the funding was incredible. So like you, you, you know, when, so when you're applying to do your master's, essentially it means that you want to take your practice as an artist to another level in a more concentrated fashion. So don't do it just because you think you should don't follow the puppy mill factory path. I took 10 years between, I didn't even think I was going to do my master's. And then I realized, Oh, I'm not trying to sell art. You know, I'd, I'd exhibited in galleries for years before my master's, I had a pretty successful commercial thing. And then that ship sailed. I was like, I'm not interested in putting pictures above coaches. So I went into the studio and I wasn't making any money. I was getting broke. And I thought I should go to school because that's kind of what <laughs> being a student's like, you know? And, uh, and so that's what the master's was for me is I got to focus on my work and the comfort of the institution. And they paid me to go to school for three years. It was fucking awesome. Kind of like an escape from life. Anyway, I keep swearing. Like an extended, like an extended residency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it is, it is and I met my beautiful wife there. I mean, hello. No, anyway. Uh, you find your tribe. 
you find your tribe. Yeah, yeah. So does that answer your question about the masters? Like the next, it's the next level of schooling. Usually two years. Yeah, I, I mean, there might be an exception or I, is it two? And usually the, the, the way that it's usually loosely structured is that you'll have kind of two classes, maybe three classes per term. One is going to be pure studio and it's completely open and self-driven and self-motivated, but everybody else is there just to kind of give you critiques and put a fire under your seat, you know? Um, the other class is going to be more around kind of, um, you know, art theory, conceptual, uh, all, all the conceptual kind of stuff and helping you to zero in on what your ideas are so that you can write a thesis. Um, and usually, and then there may be another class that's kind of like this, like showing up to lectures and, and you know, or doing studio visits or that kind of thing. And usually the output of a master's program in order to graduate is a large body of work. So probably something substantial enough so that you could have a proper like solo show or one kind of really complex, <laughs> more complex kind of project uh, and, um, and a, a thesis. So here at Emily Carr, we do, yeah, we do ask for a thesis, which is, uh, I don't know, I think mine was about 60 pages, but that included like the bibliography. I think now they've actually shortened it because they thought they were asking for too much, but that's, yeah, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to do the writing too. Yeah. One page at University of Auburn. <laughs> there you go. So that was the appeal for me at the universe. Well, you, you had a different program. So some schools are research focused, others are studio focused. So if you know you just want to shut up and make work and talk about it later, University of Alberta <laughs> for the fine arts department. And then, and then I know for a fact the design department is totally different. It's, it's complete research focused, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the appeal to me of that school. I, I was clear that the conceptual side of things are super important, but I didn't want to put that much. I didn't want to write a 60 page paper on. I want to paint. I saw somebody's CV recently and they had <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great idea. If you got the money, you got the exactly. The funding, the studio space. Dentistry. Hi. <laughs> Whoa, that's loud. Um, I guess when I think about career pathways, I personally get filled with a lot of kind of doubt, like the whole decision making process of it. And I was kind of wondering if any of you experienced any of that kind of doubt about picking where you want to go <laughs> in your. <laughs> in your careers and if so how did you deal with that how did you finally kind of buckle down and do it you know thank you well um so i went into teaching for very practical reasons um like i said and then um self-doubt oh my god self-doubt can be so it can be so crippling and so honestly like i went i i was because I was diagnosed with cancer, it just was like a total slap across the face. And I hope for everybody in the room that you don't have to have that type of slap. But I do think um, for me, like as an artist, I always felt like um, when I was at art school, I felt very like I was kind of a fraud. And, you know, I, I knew that I was attracted to being um, with this type, these type of people and talking about you know, artwork. And I was really interested in artwork, but I never felt like, um, kind of good enough. And so it took a real like intense thing to happen to me to like, um, kind of have the strength. But what I can say on the other side of that is that, um, I really think be creative, just be courageous. Like it's, um, I heard a really great term about being courageous because when you say that it's just like a platitude, but um, when you're radically courageous, it means that you don't feel courageous, that you feel scared. You, you have all the doubt and all of that stuff, but you throw yourself out there, like just step forward and do it. Like put the art on the wall, uh, try to get a show, call yourself 
an artist, a teacher, whatever it is that you want to be, like call yourself that, own it, and then do the practice. And um, I think that that's, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Like, you, you know, like we, we, the doubt and all of that stuff is just, you know, it just holds you back. Like you, you, you have to like embrace it. So I like that idea of radical courageousness in that you are being courageous, even though you do not feel like it, or you don't know where that's coming from. So, oh, and what I would say is also surround yourself with people that you admire that, that are giving you, um, feedback that is really helpful and helping you grow and that support you. So they're not, you know, like I, I had, I had shown people art of mine and they're just like, I don't know, like, I, like, I, oh. like, you know, they just didn't get it and it made me feel terrible. But, um, if you surround, <laughs> surround yourself with people that can give you great feedback that will move you along, um, you know, that's very, very important. So, yeah. I think that's a great question and an important one. And um, in our society, we kind of look at doubt and fear and failure in the wrong light. Those are necessary components of everything that is in life. You know, failure is the greatest lesson. You got to fail. You got so don't be afraid of it. Just go into it. Lean into it. Um, I always say that if I'm not scared in my own paintings, I'm comfortable. And I know, you know, what that yields, what kind of results that yields. So I'm always putting pressure on myself to surprise myself, every single painting. It's, so uh, that's where the tribe, your crew, your people uh, matters. People who get it, they come in, they see your work and they're like, well, no, Windows yeah. <laughs> so like one of my best friends comes into my studio, uh, painter who I respect a lot and he says mm, what do you think I'm like and he goes your colors are pretty candy like they're pretty sweet like sugary best critique I ever got totally messed me up for about six months and I, you know but it was so to the point so anyway you need your crew your tribe and when you leave school uh, you're at you're at risk of losing that and uh, that's actually something if I could go back in time I would have maintained those relationships and I would have held on to them as much as possible. The other thing I would go back in time is I'd be more vulnerable. I have been so afraid of opening up and, you know, opening up and showing my work, having critiques. I've got a good friend, Andrew Moncrief, who's courageous. He just moved to Berlin and he shows his work all the time. He just opens up his practice and he's flourishing right now. And I think it's because of that courage to be vulnerable. And I'm just scared, you know, and because it can derail you. If you get a critique in the wrong time, it can really mess with you. Have any of you guys experienced that? Yeah. How long? I'm just curious. How long did it take you out for? Anybody like anybody like six months? Four months? Four months? No, from another, from another, right? Two weeks, you know, so sometimes. So and then that happens multiple times in your life. So I've gone through about four massive blows, four. And it took a lot to get my pieces back up. And then it was usually the voice of someone who knows what, you know, they, they're familiar with what you're going through and they know how to pick you up. So, yeah, I just think don't be afraid of that stuff. Lean into it because that's actually what, you know, what's what you are subjected to determines your subjectivity. So subject yourself to some interesting stuff. Don't be lame about it. Don't be comfortable. We've already seen all that stuff. You got to make something new for the world. That's what we're doing here, right? Trying to shake people up. Ah! <laughs> Getting all pumped up here. <laughs> yeah, it's. I I love I love what you're saying, right? I mean, we're not we're not going into manufacturing. We're going into making art, and so it's going to be super uncomfortable. Um, I, you know, I know artists that are in their 80s that have won all the awards that have had all the shows and all the museums that I'm just like wow you know if I could if I could make it to that point in my career like I'll have I'll have made it I'll have made something of myself 
but they have self-doubt and they're like, oh, nobody likes me and nobody wants my work and blah, blah, blah. And they're having the exact same kind of internal dialogue um, that, that all of us have, even when we're just starting out. So I think keeping that in mind, knowing that, you know, um, no level of success will cure you of that in a way is kind of nice because you can just see it as another one of your tools. It's just another color on your, on your palette is that self-doubt and it's okay. You can, you can kind of dip into it. Um, I, I think accepting it is really important. There's a, there's an artist who, uh, who's actually an alumni, uh, from here, uh, Vanessa Brown, a sculptor. And, um, I invited her once to, to speak to my class and she said uh, there's this really interesting technique that she had that she shared with us. And it was, um, she called it her CV of failures. And I just thought that's so interesting because you're not, you, you're not going to get any opportunities if you don't put yourself out there. So you're not going to feel better. You're not going to have anything to look back on and be like, oh, no, I, no, it's okay. Like I am kind of on the right path unless you put yourself out there. But when you're emerging, you have to kind of apply to 20 opportunities in order to get one yes. And that's, that's, that's so, I mean, that's rough. And a lot of people kind of quit or stop doing it because of that, because it's super hard. And her technique of almost celebrating those rejections and having a long list, and it was a long CV and she's a, she's a very successful artist. So it was, it was, you know, interesting to see, but the more no's that you get, just gets you closer to that yes. And so I think seeing it that way, it's it's all kind of a matter of of perspective. And then I'd, I'd like to echo what Tristas was saying too about community, like build community, go to openings. Your, your, yeah, it's your job as an artist is to go and be there for other artists and be there for your community and support them. We can't expect others to support us if we're not supporting them. And if you go and you show up, even though it's uncomfortable, I know artists are not usually necessarily the most outgoing bunch. Um, <laughs> I had to kind of train myself to really love the openings and the parties. Uh, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a conscious effort that I made. Um, but eventually you realize, oh, it's the same faces, right? And then maybe eventually they see you two, three times and then they start talking to you and then you start making friends and then next thing you know, you're in like the art community and you've got Right, the the people that uh, just us and uh, and Justin are talking about the people that can give you that that feedback or that can call you an artist, and then that helps you to kind of recognize yourself as that as well. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Thank you. I think that's the perfect note to close this on. Um, we have a bunch of snacks over there. Please have them. Stick around. Talk to the panelists, and let's give them a round of applause.